All right, any other announcements? Thank you all for being here. Uh, we have uh, State Senator C.B. Embry and State Representative Tommy Thompson with us. And uh, I think it would be a, a waste of our time for me to try to introduce them. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and turn the program over to them. And uh, we decided to go in alphabetical order. So, uh, Senator Embry, you're up first. Glad to be with you today. Um, I'm going to talk some on the uh, session, and uh, Tommy and I are both talking on the same subject, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, I uh, am honored that you uh, have selected me to represent you as your state senator, being the uh, first Ohio County native in, in 60 years to do that, so that dedicates me strongly to uh, making sure that Ohio County receives their right to share the state budget and uh, uh, working very closely with the Chamber and Bluegrass Crossing and others to uh, make sure that we're doing everything we can to develop uh, more jobs, not only bringing them in, but uh, additional jobs with the companies and businesses, businesses that we have now, uh, helping them expand. In the Senate, the leadership was very kind to me and allowed me to uh, bring my years of service in the House to the Senate to count that uh, towards seniority that uh, allows me to be ranked eighth in the Senate. Uh, Tommy and I both uh, came in uh, 13 years ago. We, we were elected uh, at the same time. And uh, so uh, being in the uh, seniority that is a plus, and we need all the pluses we can get uh, nowadays. Uh, I'm also serving in the majority there, as uh, uh, Representative Thompson does in the House. That is also a plus. Uh, so uh, hopefully that will uh, be a benefit. I serve as chairman of the Tobacco Settlement. Agreement Fund Oversight Committee, and uh, so for this uh, uh, 2015 fiscal year, they have awarded $273,000 in projects in the 6th District, the 6th District being Ohio, Butler, Lundberg, and Hopkins. That is from the uh, Kentucky Agriculture Development Fund. Uh, that fund is funded by the Tobacco Settlement Fund. Of that $273,000 uh, that has been awarded this fiscal year, $137,000 of that was for Ohio County. So uh, they did very well. And I aim to uh, make sure that continues uh, the best I can. I also serve as uh, chairman of the Appropriations and Revenue Education Subcommittee. That's good because I'm very strong for education. and. I'm a uh, retired teacher myself, having taught in the Ohio <coughs> County school system, uh, places like Horse Branch, Pleasant Ridge, and Cromwell. I also served as Vice Chairman of the Veterans, Military Affairs, and Public Protection Committee. Uh, I traditionally uh, support uh, many bills dealing with veterans, and I'll touch on that in a moment. I also serve on the Natural Resources and Energy Committee, the Transportation Committee, and the Agriculture Committee. All of those are uh, uh, good for me. I support coal and being on the Natural Resources Committee, I'm well placed. Transportation and all the help we can get for roads and bridges. And of course, agriculture is very important to our area. Okay, to the session. We had. Um, 747, excuse me, 757 bills filed, 757, 120 passed. That is actually a little better than average. That was 15.8%. We usually pass something like 10 to 15% of the bills filed. It's very difficult for a bill to file. We have to have a 
majority agreement in, in both chambers. Uh, and that, that's difficult. Let me touch on some of the highlights. Senate Bill 192, the anti-heroin bill, that was a top priority. Uh, that is particularly a problem in northern Kentucky. Uh, they have been losing three to five people a week from drug overdoses with heroin, and it's spreading uh, elsewhere in the state, so we are trying our best to, to stop it in its tracks. Uh, we are attempting to counter this surge in heroin uh, abuse uh, and reduce the deaths that's been uh, afflicting many Kentucky families. This bill signed into law by Governor Bashir will combat the uh, heroin epidemic. It provides increased treatments for addicts and increased penalties for dealers, hopefully sending a message that when it comes to heroin, Kentucky is closed for business. Now, our session this year ended at 3.20 a.m. Wednesday, uh, March the 25th. Later that day, because of this epidemic and the seriousness of the heroin problem, uh, Governor Fletcher signed that bill into law immediately, and it had an emergency clause. So it went into effect immediately. House Bill 152, the telecommunications bill. This bill uh, uh, has been discussed and debated for several sessions that had not passed until this year. Uh, it deregulates current telephone requirements to provide more private sector funding for broadband, wireless, and mobile phone expansion throughout the state. Makes the Commonwealth more attractive to business and improves the quality of life of our citizens. Uh, Expanded broadband is very important in the rural areas. That bill passed. It was not without controversy because, of, like I say, it, it failed several years. But this year it did pass. HB, uh, HB 8, dating violence, uh, answers the call to address dating violence, sexual abuse, and stalking. Uh, in the form of a uh, protective order. Before this bill was signed in, uh, into law, victims of dating violence in Kentucky had to file criminal charges against their partner in hopes of preventing ongoing abuse. This new legislation adds an important layer of protection for vi vi victims of dating violence and hopes to slow down this type of abuse with uh, new sanctions. Uh, so that's an important bill. Uh, House Bill 298 deals with the Medical Research Center, and this was special to me for a certain reason. Uh, it permits the construction of a state-of-the-art medical research center to target preventive diseases in Kentucky, including cancer, diabetes, and uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases. It authorizes the insurance and bonds to help build this research center for the University of Kentucky, and the UK will match that amount of bonding uh, with their own funds to construct this new research center. Uh, we, unfortunately, have a nation in, in the percent of our citizens who have many diseases, uh, cancer, diabetes, heart, it goes on and on. So this would be a good uh, uh, step to help research to combat those diseases. The reason this is, was a little bit special for me uh, when my late father served in the Senate in the late 40s. Uh, he was instrumental in uh, working on a bill that established the uh, uh, medical center training for doctors uh, at the University of Kentucky. Prior to that, to become a doctor, you had to get your education in another state. And, uh, that was a big step forward for Kentucky to be able to train our own physicians. So I think this uh, activity with this uh, research center to combat these diseases is also a big step on our behalf. I, uh, one of my bills that passed was uh, Senate Bill 67. I filed that on behalf of the NRA National Private Association. Uh, that will enable people to get their uh, uh, concealed carry permits a little bit easier. Uh, 
and more conveniently, and in some cases, uh, save them some money. I uh, also uh, had a bill that honored one of our veterans. Now, last year, when I was still in the house, we uh, passed the bill, uh, one of mine, that named the uh, Natural Parkway section of Ohio and Butler County the uh, Medal of Honor Recipient Trail. And that was honoring Wesley Phelps and Don Jenkins, two uh, Medal of Honor winners, one from Ohio and one from Butler. This year I had a family in Hanson, Kentucky, in Hopkins County, that asked me to uh, name a bridge that enters Hanson from the parkway in honor of uh, one of their uh, family members who lost his life fighting for our nation in, in Vietnam. And I did that and it passed. Uh, you might say naming bridges and, and roads uh, that's not a real big issue. However, uh, people who do heroic things for their country and who pay the supreme sacrifice sometimes doing so, uh, we can't honor them enough. And uh, this means a whole lot to their families as well. So uh, I think it's a good thing. Usually each session I try to address something like that. Now, Representative Thompson and I are speaking on the same subject of what happened in the General Assembly this last session. So I will go on and on about all the bills. Like I said, we passed 120. We, we don't have that much time. I'm going to let uh, Representative Thompson take the ball and go from here with uh, some comments from uh, the House of Representatives. Glad to be with you. CB, thank you, and uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Edith and Levi and David Fig for Rice's contribution to this. I want to thank the chamber. You all altered your meeting. I know we had that great meeting at Kimball not too long ago, David, and that was really enjoyable to see the expansion that continues to go on there and over 200 employees, which certainly helps the Fordsville area and Ohio County. But I want to thank the chamber for altering your old schedule to let us come and visit with you and kind of give a, a summary of what happened in the legislature before it got real stale and uh, you learned everything about it. Otherwise. So thank you all for giving us this opportunity. It's a pleasure to, to work with CB and, uh, you know, as he mentioned, you've got to, to accomplish something. You have to have progress and success in both chambers. So I've worked in the House and with CB in the Senate. Uh, hopefully we can... Uh, make some things happen for Ohio County, which certainly is important and one of our top priorities. Uh, I'll just kind of add uh, a couple of comments to the good points that CB mentioned and maybe touch on a couple of other items. But as you all know, this was our short session, our 30-day session, and less it was even shorter because of the weather, the unprecedented weather that we had. Uh, we were out, I think we missed about four days all together in the house from the 30 days we started with. So it really got compacted and the Senate lost several days. So that even made it more challenging and more difficult. And CB talked about the number of bills that were introduced. And one of the problems that we're having, in my opinion, is that when we moved back in 2000 to go to annual session, Charlotte, the purpose of an annual session or having annual sessions was to, in the off year, like the one we're in now, the odd number of years, was to just do some tweaking on bills that had passed in the previous session that needed some technical corrections, if you will. Maybe do a lot of vetting on bills that are going to be coming up in the next session, get ready for the budget, uh, and just kind of slow roll some things. But now we seem like we try to introduce as many bills in the short session as we do in the long session, and there's just too much volume. It's, it's hard to get your hands around all of it, and I hope that we can move more to a situation where we prioritize the things that we'd like to accomplish in a short session to make sure that we can do those, because this was a non-budget year, but certainly uh, no shortage of issues facing the state. Uh, just quickly on the heroin that CB talked about, which certainly is a scourge afflicting a lot of Kentuckians, the thing that really caught my attention about how it had progressed, um, they had done some autopsies in 2010 
to overdose victims. And at that time, about five to eight percent of them had heroin in their bloodstream. When they did those autopsies in 2014, 38 percent of them had heroin in their bloodstream. So it's really proliferated in terms of um, its impact on our citizens, and it, we had to do something about it. And there was strong consensus on going to both chambers and both parties to address this issue. And we ramped up the penalties, particularly for those so-called commercial traffickers that are dealing with a kilo or more. And uh, one thing that we just got to do with this and a lot of substance abuse, Levi, as you know, is just provide more treatment. So much of this substance abuse is an addic it's addiction, it's a cancer. Uh, you can't just incarcerate yourself out of the problem. You know, we've got to provide more treatment. So we provided $10 million of immediate money to ramp up the treatment for heroin victims. And also, as I said, we ramped up the, the penalties for it. So hopefully we'll start to see some arrests in that, but it seems like every time we make success on the abuse front, they find some other vehicle. You know, we've had success on pill mills and on the methamphetamine, where we've had some success in Kentucky. And heroin is easy to obtain; it's fairly cheap, so it's kind of become the opioid of choice. But I think these new rules will help us arrest it some. Uh, and on the dating violence, uh, as CB mentioned, uh, that was something that very few states. Uh, allow. Kentucky was one of them where, you know, a dating couple couldn't have a civil protection order issued if they were abused by their partner. And so now we've moved to correct that. Uh, I think that's a plus and will provide more protection for uh, individuals that are in dating relationships, just like those now that are married or living together have that benefit. Uh, one thing that we passed uh, was an increase in our booster seat requirements for our young people. We've got to do everything we can, I think, to ensure their safety while they're riding in cars. So, like most other states, we moved our standards up a bit. Now you have to be eight years old instead of seven, so we moved the age in which you have to remain in the booster seat from seven to eight, and also increased the weight from 50 to, or excuse me, the height from 50 to 57 inches. A lot of statistics have shown that young people under that height and under that age that take a seat belt on for protection can really injure themselves versus being in a booster seat. So we made those changes, which I think hopefully will protect the safety of our, of our young kids. On the research facility that CB talked about, we desperately needed to do that. At UK, we funded it in a non-budget year. We opened in the budget and provided bonding for $132.5 million to match the $132.5 to make $265 that Kentucky will provide. In the, as CB was mentioning, we're the 45th least healthy state in the nation. So anything we can do to encourage more research to address the affirmities that Kentuckians have and to hopefully provide cures and help to arrest those diseases um, can help us all. So I think that research facility is going to be a great move in that direction. Uh, Kentucky, the University of Kentucky Chandler Medical Center recently got a very coveted designation. It was a National Cancer Institute which there's not many of them around the country. So, John, we need to really leverage that, and I think we can do that with this uh, research facility. Um, CB talked about the communication bill. Uh, we had uh, one thing that I thought was the most significant piece of legislation uh, that we passed, and I thought it was the most significant problem that we had, and that was our road fund. And thanks to David, who was such an advocate for this and came up uh, at a, at a hearing and it came up at a rally that we had. But Kentucky's road fund, you know, our gas tax provides 48% of the money that comes from rural secondary and municipal road aid comes from Kentucky's fuel tax, our motor fuel tax, and the other 52% goes for new roads. So that motor fuels tax is incredibly important and it's a complicated formula. It's based on the average wholesale price of gasoline, but it didn't have a floor, it just had a ceiling that couldn't go up more than 10% in any one year. So with oil prices cascading and retreating, our fuel tax was going down. We'd already lost about a third of our road fund before we acted. And if we hadn't done something to freeze that floor, uh, we could have lost in total about $300 million to our state's road fund. And if any of y'all had any potholes lately or seen any potholes, we know first of all what the winter did to our roads. And it's so important that we have those funds, Jim, so that we can protect the safety of people driving, the convenience of people driving, uh, that we can enhance commerce by having better roads. 
uh, and it was just critical that we did something about that. So fortunately, in the final hours, we moved collectively in the House and the Senate to freeze the floor. It's, it's going to be at 27 and a half cents, but we just thought it would be better to give that, that money to Kentucky's roads and to give it to the big oil companies. Uh, so I think it was a prudent move that we did, and it'll help uh, sustain uh, the needed maintenance on our, on our roads in Kentucky. Um, we had a, uh, oh, several other bills that, uh, you know, in different areas. Those were probably the most significant bills that passed during the session. I might comment on some of them that didn't pass that I thought were important. Uh, we had a, a bill that was uh, called the Local Initiative for Transformation, uh, LIF, sometimes called the Local Option Sales Tax, that just simply and, and in summary would give local communities that so choose to make a cause to ask its citizens to fund on a limited basis a significant priority project in their community like a convention center or an arts facility or a park, parking garage, sewage treatment system, new <coughs> water line distribution system. Uh, 37 other states allow their cities to consider a local option sales tax. And the great thing about this is it was the essence of home rule. I don't think anything could have been more democratic than the way that this was postured. And first of all, a community would have to sell First of all, we would have to pass a constitutional amendment. So we would simply, in this session, and move. We passed it in the House, and unfortunately, it didn't pass it in the Senate, but it would authorize the circulation next year of a constitutional amendment to ask the citizens of Kentucky that question. So if it had passed, it would have been on the ballot next year. And then uh, after that, a, a community would make a decision. They'd have to do anything. But if they decided they wanted to consider a project under this vehicle, they would take it to the citizens in the form of a referendum. And the people in the community would make that decision on their quality of life, on their future destiny, on what kind of community they wanted to have. So much today is happening uh, in terms of people being attracted to a community is based on the, the quality of place. What kind of community do you have? How attractive is it? Is it does it have good roads? Does it have good economic opportunities? Does it have good health care? Uh, do they have a diverse economy? So. We thought this was a vehicle to give those communities that so chose it to have that tool, if you will, in their toolbox in the event that they want to choose it. Wouldn't it. They don't have to do anything if they didn't want to. That was the beauty of it, that it was a local option and local initiative. So we uh, had a lot of discussion about that. A lot of people supported it, Dave, but just didn't get all the way through. So it very well may be considered uh, the next time. Another initiative that I was disappointed we didn't pass was the so-called P3 legislation, public-private partnerships. That's where the public entities like the state and private entities would pool their resources to do a project collectively that they could not do individually. <coughs> uh, we're doing that now. The University of Kentucky is doing that on building student housing. You may have seen and read about. Uh, we're doing it in our managed care situation, Charlotte, with our MCOs. That's a public-private partnership between the state and the uh, MCOs. But we can't do it in Kentucky for mega projects like bridges and super highways or, or major roads like so many other states can do. And candidly, Kentucky just doesn't have the resources to do those mega projects on their own, nor do the private concerns have the resources to do it by themselves. Uh, you saw the Lowell Bridges, which are now under construction if you've been up there lately. Uh, that's a project that's been in the hopper for 20 years. And finally, it's a reality, and a lot of that was because it was allowed to be told. Um, up in northern Kentucky, uh, they desperately need a bridge up there, the Brent Spence Bridge. A lot of debate on whether that should be told or not, but I don't think it can ever be built unless that's part of the revenue package. But we, uh, I was hoping that we could have passed that. We had some folks from northern Kentucky, CB, as you know, that really resisted it. Uh, at the expense of, of a lot of other people around the, uh, the state. So uh, I hope when we go back uh, that we can consider that again and pass it because it's a great way to infuse private money with the public. And I think that's the essence of government when you can, you know, government doesn't create jobs. It can just provide the atmosphere to be conducive for job creation. And if we can have the private sector more involved partnering with government, we can get a lot of things done for the Commonwealth. Uh, one bill that we've worked on on our side a lot is uh, increase the minimum wage in Kentucky. 
Um, some 27 states have done that in absence of the federal government doing it. Uh, we just felt like that uh, people needed to have a living wage and so many people that are making a minimum wage can't exist with their rent or mortgage payments, with their utility payments, with their taxes, property taxes going up. And most of the people have shown empirically that if they get an increase in their wage, they spend it. So it infuses that money back into the economy. Uh, we had a significant debate on that and um, didn't pass all the way through, but I think we'll see some more discussion with it because in absence of the federal government moving, which they've done in the past, but now having done it in about five years, we by the states are starting to move in absence of that. And as I said, some 20 some odd states have already raised their, their minimum wage. Uh, another big point of contention in this session was the smoking ban, the statewide smoking ban which got more traction than it's ever received. It, it passed out of the House of Representatives for the first time with bipartisan support, but didn't pass over in the Senate. And we all know the vicissitudes of secondhand smoke and how many deaths are lost in Kentucky every year because of smoking and the cost of smoking to employers and the cost of the health insurance <clears throat> arena because of smoking. Um, but, you know, some folks felt like it needed to be a local initiative as opposed to a statewide initiative. A lot of cities and counties have smoking bans already in Kentucky, but it's just not statewide. As you all know, there's been a lot of discussion about that here in Ohio County for good reason. Uh, so, uh, and a poll recently that came out showed that a majority of Kentuckians would like to have a statewide smoking ban. Just like if I can segue back to the local initiative for transformation a poll that came out just after we adjourned showed that 63% of Kentuckians would like to have that choice. So they both polled pretty well, but we didn't get the, uh, didn't get the smoking ban passed. And then finally, one thing less that was a huge issue that will continue to be, and that's the Kentucky teachers' retirement system. Uh, it's in a desperate situation, and even though it's uh, in a better position than the Kentucky retirement system, Nonetheless, we need to impose some structural changes to it, to, to two things, to honor the promise that we made to our most important teachers who have the, probably the most critical job in our state, and that's educating our young people and providing for their future. But also, we need to ensure the financial stability of it going forward, so when those good teachers retire, those benefits are there that they paid in for. But candidly, due to uh, lower than expected earnings, uh, and the fact that the state hasn't been able to make the full contribution to the plan, uh, it, has, it has a pretty significant unfunded liability, meaning that we don't have enough assets to cover the future liabilities. So uh, we're going to have to address this going forward. It's a problem that most states face. Uh, it's not going to go away, uh, and it's going to be a long-term solution to it. But we've got to start dealing with it today. In the House, we had proposed some so-called pension bonds to infuse some immediate money into it to stem the losses. Uh, the Senate had another direction, so we didn't get anywhere with that. I think it's going to be reduced to a study that will be going on this session to see uh, maybe where we can build some consensus on addressing it. But uh, it's, a, it's about 52% funded, meaning it has 52 cents of assets to cover every dollar of liability, where the Kentucky retirement system, Jim, where most of the state employees are, and the county and city employees is only about 21% funded. So, and they both have huge unfunded liabilities, but again, we're not unique in Kentucky to that effect. And one thing that really put that in perspective for me is that we all remember, unfortunately, the, the contraction we had between 2007 and 9 and what happened to 401k plans. Well, in 2008, Kentucky had estimated earning 7.5% on its investments, and we lost 18%. So you can see what that did to that balance, and uh, that's something that you know we're going to be a long-term making up because the investment returns in a pension plan, as John knows, make up about two-thirds of the revenue. So it's not just the state didn't contribute their full amount. There was another other ingredients and circumstances that have led to the unfunded mandates. A couple of quick things, and then I'll quiet down. Uh, I was excited about last week, although unfortunately I had to be out of state, but. The uh, bill ready pad, uh, Lieutenant Governor came here. I think that's tremendous out of Bluegrass Crossing to have that pad now ready to go for an industry that wants to come in here and, and build a building. They don't have to wait six months or a year to get all the improvements and 
make sure that everything is ready to go. So um, I think that's the fifth one in Kentucky now. So that's really positive to have that here in this great industrial park. And then the new road that CB we worked on getting funded is going to go in and have a new entrance into the industrial park where you won't have to go through Jim and through the residential area, which is hurt. And there was a huge industry looking at Ohio County about a year ago, Judge, as you know, and that was a big concern they had about these truck movements that were going to be about 200 a day. They didn't want to contend with a school bus or maybe a child running out from a home on that road. So we're going to have a new road going into the park, and I think that'll be a big plus. And we've certainly got some good funds in the road plan to improve the road to Center Town and to do something out by Southern Elementary. And, and of course, this new road, and we'll continue to work on that. But um, I just want to end by thanking you all for <coughs> giving me the privilege of serving Ohio County the state <coughs> legislature. And certainly, I always look forward to your all's comments and critiques and advice because we do a better job when we listen and learn from you all. But, it's a privilege to be here. And I think uh, Kentucky has got a lot of positive things going for us now. I'll end on that. Our unemployment rate in the state is the lowest it's been since 2002. It's 5.1%. It's even lower than the national unemployment rate. And one thing that was really significant, I thought, that shows that we're kind of moving forward again after years of having to reduce our budget and be austere in how we spent your money, is that the... Um, there's a magazine called um, uh, Site Selection. It's based in Atlanta, very well reputed in the economic development world. And every year they have a competition for what they call the Governor's Cup. And that's awarded to states that have both in terms of numbers and per capita, the most significant amount of economic activity being engaged by business growth and expansion. And Kentucky came in first in that competition in the whole country per capita for the most new and expanded businesses. So I was excited about that. Obviously, we need to do more in economic development to create more jobs, have an earning wage, make sure our folks have an opportunity to earn a living in Kentucky and stay in Kentucky and not have to go to other states to pursue those opportunities. But I thought that Governor's Cup Award was incredibly significant and gave Kentucky a lot of status, and we just need to build on that. But Thank you all uh, for everything the Chamber does, for your all's efforts to promote commerce and quality of life here in Ohio County. A lot of positive things happening here with the coal industry. And Jim, thank you all for the tremendous employment at Purdue. We've got, what, 12 or 1,300 uh, uh, associates out there, and you all are such a big part of the economy here, but uh, we all just need to keep working together to make this an even better place to call home. So thanks for your time. And, if we've got a few minutes and haven't given you all indigestion, uh, I know CB and I'll be glad to take some questions or take any advice you might want to offer. Well, I, I have a question. I, I saw today that uh, the governor ceremoniously signed the film incentives bill. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that you have kind of been pushing for something like this for a long time because Anybody who's a Justified fan knows that it's set in Kentucky, but you can tell it's not filmed in Kentucky. And I just wondered if you would uh, speak on what you think this might do for the economy down the line. Yeah, I think it can be incentive to attract, you know, we need to diversify our economy as much as we can. This is another way to diversify, to try to get entice more people to come to Kentucky and use the great resources we have and the top offering that we have to think about doing film productions here, doing commercials here in Kentucky. Uh, you know, some of Secretariat uh, was filmed at Keeneland, uh, but we need to get more movies here. And, and the First Lady was particularly involved in this legislation that, as you said, just recently was passed. So I think it'll serve to uh, entice and incent more people in the film industry, if you will, to come look at Kentucky and think about, you know, doing their productions here or doing some part of it here whether it be for commercial or uh, retail or whether it be for uh, commercials, rather. Uh, but, uh, and we've got uh, some folks here that can help us, you know, sell Kentucky and uh, that are in the Hollywood arena right now that are from Kentucky, uh, the Johnny Depps and, and others. So uh, I hope that that will be a good piece of legislation. And one thing, too, I, I mentioned is that CB helped on this, but we are really proud to get the uh, – the crab aid bill passed in this session. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, 
the young lady who was such a hero for that. And we had the, we had the signing, and Dave, you remember, you were there when the governor came down and signed that bill in. Uh, and then she passed away the next day. But I mean, it was a godsend. She wanted to stay to make sure that, you know, as I said, that wouldn't happen and inflict any more newborns. So now, in Kentucky, we've added that screening to the 54 other items, I think, that are in the screening panel so that when people can track that horrible disease, they can detect it immediately, hopefully do something about it so they can have a, a gainful life as opposed to a short life like Anne Marie did. But uh, that, was a, that was a good thing to do, and we really enjoyed being part of that. She, that was, she was quite an inspiration. That was one of the real good uh, legislations that we passed. Yeah. I was a co sponsor. I was uh, tied up that day when they made the bill signing, but uh, that was a really good. Uh, legislation the uh, film thing is also uh, outstanding I think it would create a lot more revenue for our state and jobs we've had some of that in the past we need to really uh, gear it up now uh, in country was uh, filmed down near Murray uh, Rain Tree County near uh, Danville uh, we have had some big uh, films uh, in Kentucky this will create the opportunity of encouragement and incentive to, uh, to gear that up in the future. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Ms. Charlotte. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the waiver program? I know it's expanded uh, under this session. And I don't know if you hear that or you know what I'm talking about. But under Medicaid, <coughs> the waiver, uh, yeah, there were some additional waivers provided, which which uh, is important. And you know, you've got to go, uh, you know, to CDC, and you've got to go to Medicaid, Medicare management to get those waivers to operate outside of the uh, limits of, of Medicaid. And you know, Kentucky has applied for. So Arkansas just really put in a whole new Medicaid system based upon a significant series of waivers that they were able to obtain. I'm not totally conversant on all the most recent ones that were adopted, but I know there have been some that have helped us be more in control of our system as opposed to having to follow federal guidelines that aren't necessarily mirroring the way Kentucky needs and wants are. I know the judge and I was in a meeting recently with Christian Care Homes. We were trying very desperately to bring an adult day back. Yes, and we need more money for adult day care yes, and exactly. meals on wheels. And, and, and this will help people that are on Medicaid yeah. to get more of those in-home services. And, uh, you, know, that's you know, we you're right, and it, we've got to for two reasons, for quality of life and for cost, but we have to give more emphasis, I think, on home care than we do on institutional care. And the institutional care, which is a big part of Medicaid, you know, the vast majority of dollars from Medicaid go to institutional care, but it's so expensive compared to the alternative. So, you know, we can, we can treat and have more here at home, I think it's a plus. And I think statistics show that out of Kentucky dollar, 81 cents goes to long term care yeah. versus 19 to keep the people in their home. So uh -huh. let's hope someday that's 50 50 to see more people. And, and in try their to homes. find and just find ways to entice more caregivers, yes. which we really need. Sure. Yes, sir. Yeah. I was concerned about the AT&T bill, and I know it's got some very good points in it. If not, you all would have voted for it. But uh, I know that when AT&T, when they bought out Mall Bell, they, they were under certain obligations to provide services. I live in a rural area that I don't have access to internet, fiber optic internet, DSL, Grad Connect, or cell phone service. So we depend upon our landline. Right. Me and quite a few neighbors depend upon our landline. And I know that AT&T probably spent enough money maybe to lobby in Frankfurt that we could have had those services. And I'm just wondering if there still is, by them being deregulated, is there still, is the bill still structured that they're gonna to have to provide landline service in rural areas until they can provide these other services? I mean, if you just let them go right now, yeah. if you have a problem with AT&T, you can threaten to call the FCC. But if they're gonna be deregulated, are they going to be able just to pull us out, pull out? I think if you have a line here that, that you can keep it, that's the, it would be the new people that would come in uh, to uh, ask for service, they would not be able to get away. Right. 
But was that addressed in the bill? Was yeah, it was. And, I, and Charlotte and, and our good folks at AARP and Scott and everybody, I mean, really addressed that and, and made okay. sure, you know, they had some very significant and reasonable concerns about that. But it's really moving. Yeah, they're not, and I'm convinced, they're not going to take landlines away from anybody that has it now. It's just going forward, they want to have the flexibility to go to the next generation of services. A lot, a lot of customers today are wanting more and faster mobile and more mobile devices and they're wanting more broadband and more internet like you don't have. Uh, and that's what people are asking for, more high speed internet, more access to internet. And that's, they, they wanted to have the flexibility with that bill to direct more of their resources to that. So for example, when they go into a new community, where normally they might have, let's just pick a number, maybe there's 20 people that are going to live on two streets and only three of the people wanted a landline, the other people wanted mobile devices. They just didn't want to have to put in all the expensive landlines for fewer people. But they don't. They certainly don't want to take customers away or lose customers that they already have. So I was convinced, and we asked those tough questions that you're asking about that because you know a lot of people, that's all you have is that landline in Charlotte, as you know, a lot of those landlines are tied to medical devices, you know, and they, they've got to have that landline to have that medical device work or an alarm system or something like that. So I'm, I'm comfortable that they're aware of that and they're sensitive to it, but they just want to try to have some flexibility like they've gotten in most other of our surrounding states, and they want to spend another $100 million or so between Sprint and AT&T over the next couple of years of moving into more of these mobile devices. And I might mention one of the CV note that Kentucky finally is moving really aggressively to providing statewide broadband. And our good friend Burl Morris, <laughs> who many of you all know, well, he, he contacts me a lot about what are you all doing, but uh, Kentucky's entered into a public-private partnership to provide statewide broadband in a, in a pretty fast... Uh, I think about 2018. Yeah. So they hope to have it. yeah, I know the broadband... Yeah, I, mean, I wish we had it today. I know broadband's a big issue, uh, and I know that uh, cell phones and things are, you know, but it seemed like you can drive all over the country and you can have cell phone service, but there's certain areas in Kentucky they're, they're that, that when you drive through, you, you have no service. I mean, there's not a cell phone tower mm -hmm. from Livermore to, 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 to Hartford in the area. And I know that I've addressed whoever you can listen to, will listen to you from AT&T, and you say they're sensitive. They're sensitive to some issues, but they're not sensitive yeah. to other issues. We, and we, uh, we would just like, I mean, they're spending their money to get into the social media and, and, and those fast services. But what we would like, our neighbors, what we would like to just be able to pick up a phone and talk to somebody. Yeah. And, uh, and I just wanted if anybody knew. And do it with the safety. Yeah. We, uh, we did get a verbal commitment that the new apartments would be with them, that they would put landlines in those. Now, Good. next one, I'm not sure, but. The, the, what he's saying is so true in my county because Fordsville, there's at least five to six dead areas. I mean, right. You all know, driving on the West Kentucky, you don't always have home services, you right. know. And, and uh, so, you know, that is a major concern uh, for our elderly to, even if they have a cell phone, they can't call 911, you know. So that, that's an issue. But I think you really going to have to monitor this and exactly. stay on top, at least for our county. And, yeah. And uh, you know, we can get more tired, I think Rosine or Rosine's getting a Rosine new tire. Yeah. yeah, and then I know today Muhlenberg County's upgrading, you know, that may help you all with the Muhlenberg County upgrade mm -hmm. over there. So but just do everything you can to protect our seniors. Well and that's just it, we've got to monitor it. And if we see that they're not adhering to the commitments that they've made or okay. so forth, then we're we gonna to adjust to go back and hold accountable. This was a very contentious Uh, email me anytime you have a concern. 
uh, I read and answer all of my contacts. That's why I'm in my office at 2 to 6 and 6 30 in the morning. Um, so I apologize for being rude and leaving, but I also want to echo the judge's comment at Purdue. On behalf of them, I want to thank you for your support. You guys are great. Keep it up. Thank, thank you. you. And one final thing, uh, we were really honored during the session. Uh, we had Miss Kentucky up, Miss <laughs> Ramsey. And I, she's, as you all know, she's so delightful and just such a charming lady. But uh, she acquits herself in that title so well. And she came out on the floor and, and she was so engaging and, you know, met people and, you know, and then she then the green fiddle came right behind her and she played a couple of numbers and, and just mesmerized everybody in the, in the chamber. So uh, we were just so honored to have her up there, but she's quite an asset and uh, we're glad to have her. But I'm, I'm glad we got to come up and uh, give her a little bit of a platform there. Thank you all. Thank you.